All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to episode eight of the Ink Pod podcast. We have here today the one and only Marshall Atkinson from Atkinson Consulting. Yay, Marshall. that's me. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining, although I don't think that the industry needs that much of an introduction for the few users who might just be getting into the industry and has not had a chance to come across you yet. Do you mind just introducing yourself, a little bit about your business? Yeah, sure. Well, I've been I've been in the industry for a long time. Um, I got in the industry in 1993, uh, but previous to that, I was working on my master's degree in architecture and had a, uh, a, a t-shirt business to fund my master's degree, right? That's how I, that's how I got into the circus, right? Was doing that. And by the way, that was back when you had to do everything by hand because computers didn't, weren't really a thing yet. And um, so, um, you know, I uh, started doing, uh, uh, I, uh, this thing came out that changed my whole life, which was the Mac, right? And uh, nope. doing, stuff in Photoshop and freehand, which is like the precursor to Illustrator. And so the guy that was print the shop that was printing my shirts for me um, said, hey, we want to get rid of the stack camera, which is where the term camera ready comes from. And uh, we want to do everything on the computer. And at the time I was doing AutoCAD <laughs> and stuff and and they go, hey, why don't you become our art director? And um and I decided to take them up on it. And so uh, January 3rd, 1993, I became the art director for a company down in Florida. And uh, this was a small shop, uh, but I, I was integral part of helping grow that shop to, it was a pretty, it was a pretty big, pretty big deal. And, um, and um, I left that shop in 2010. I went to an even bigger shop in 2011. By then I was into operations and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I was the COO of that shop. And that was a monster 105,000 square foot shop that printed about a million shirts a month. Um, 16 autos, 160 heads of embroidery, three cornets on two shifts. Um, and um, it's just, it was just, we went through 300 and something screens a day. I mean, it's just crazy, right? So a lot of the workflow stuff and the operation stuff, that I talk about it all the time because I've worked those hundred hour weeks, right? I've had yeah. like UPS back up and you're, you're trying to get that guy a Coke cause he'll, so we'll stay because you've got 20 <laughs> more shirts on the belt. I've done all that. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I, and um, so now, you know, I just do consulting and uh, among other things and uh, I help shops um, untangle the knot. Right. So my business model is uh, clarifying effective change. So a lot of people know they need some help. They know things aren't working. And uh, I'm a resource for that to help them kind of untangle that knot and get them profitable, get them so their production schedule actual works, actually works, right? Yeah. Among other things, right? And so I do a lot of stuff. I create just uh, oodles of content and, um, you know, I'm, 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 I, I, I like teaching, so uh, it's kind of a fun job. And all I do all day, guys, is have video calls like this. <laughs> I have six, eight, ten of them a day, every day, right? So wow. it's I, all I do is talk for a living now. So it's it's way better than sweating your butt off next to the dryer. <laughs> so, yeah, hundred you know. percent. And I'm sure. I, I like I've Marshall. You've you, without knowing you've helped us tremendously in our shop be more efficient, right? I'm pretty. Uh, crazy about SOPs and things like that to, to oh, automate yeah. the shop. That's and, and my get love better, language right? is SOP, right? Yeah. Uh, I, it's all about process, right? All about processes and, and, and trying to help the team. I think when you start implementing processes, then your staff is, is just better at doing them. And they actually like having data because they can give you data, right? Um, and that's something that I didn't understand at first. And I think you're, you're probably the best person to let us know, like, as a small shop trying to, to grow right into a bigger shop, that's pretty much everybody's goal and dream. And when they're starting, mm -hmm. where do you see most print shops struggling? What's like well, what your calls, right? What do you most, see? Most people don't know what it, I call it. You don't know what you want to be when you grow up mode. Right. And so everybody wants to get to the next level. Right. So what does that mean? And yeah. for some people it's to a hundred thousand dollars, 
So some people it's to a half a million dollars. To some people it's a million dollars, right? That's yeah. where we, that's what we compare everybody to, right? Where are we on that financial spectrum? Which is the completely wrong way of thinking about it. Because it's not your total revenue that matters. It's your profit that matters, right? Yeah. That matters the most. And so I think a lot of people start, there, there's several types of pe types of folks that get in this industry, right? There's the artist that wants to monetize their creativity. There's a business person who thinks they're going to, they're going to sell lots of shirts because, you know, I, I know I can do it. I've got I'm a, a business person, right? Yeah. It, and then there's people who are kind of all in between They kind of fall into it for some different reason or whatever, but nobody really thinks about the outcome that they want. Right. And I can tell you from having conversations with people all the time at trade shows at, at, with uh, help me calls with whatever. Okay. I ask them a couple of questions and typically here's what they don't have. They don't have a business plan. They don't have a way to measure they don't have a direction. They don't have, um, you know, kind of goals that they've set, right? Like for anything, not just for revenue, but, you know, what type of customer do you want? What type of business do you want to be? How do you visualize your company 10 years from now, right? These are questions that they just scratch their head and like, I don't know, I've never thought of that, right? Yeah. And the reason why I think a lot of people struggle in this industry, regardless of your decoration method, you're an embroiderer, you're a screen printer, you're doing stuff with DTF with a heat press now or whatever, is you're not thinking about the outcome that you want by the end of this month, the end of this year, five years from now, right? And because we're not thinking about that, right, we're working out of our basement because it's low overhead. But you know what's not in the pricing? When we want to grow, we're going to have to pay rent or buy a mortgage. That's not built into the pricing now that we yeah. can have a war chest of money. So a year or two from now, when we want to get 2,000 square feet over at that strip mall, you know, and they're going to charge us 1,200 bucks a month or 2,000 bucks a month or whatever they're going to charge us, right? That's not built in our pricing. And now all of a sudden we have to have this big price increase to make that happen. And then it's just, it's chaos. Because yeah. nobody ever thought about that. And typically that's where I think a lot of people, they get off on the wrong foot. I think generally speaking, people know how to do the decoration. They figure it out. You know, they're going to make lots of mistakes and they're going to figure out how to screen print or how to sew a polo without birds nesting up the uh, thread. Or they're going to how to figure out how to do DTF. So when you bring the platen down, it doesn't move, <laughs> move the thing, you know. And they're going to figure yep. out how to do that, right? But they don't know how to do. They don't know how to write a P and L, get a P, pull a P and L. They don't ever talk to an accountant. They don't ever think about what's ahead when we start have to hire people, right? What's it like to be? You know, they've maybe have never they've never been a boss before. And now we have to have people, right? Yeah. We're not thinking about these things, and I think the reason why people can't get from here to there is because these are questions bigger than ourselves. And, and I'm sorry to say a lot of times we're guys in this industry or we're, we're a male dominated industry. Yeah. We can't raise our hand and ask for directions because we've never done that in our life. And that feels silly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Raise your hand. If you're watching right now, if you're okay with asking for directions, the answer is no. You're a guy. We'll figure it out. We'll just yeah, do it. Yeah. We'll keep driving around in circles until the <laughs> oh yeah, there's the barn. We turn there, yeah. right? That's what happens in reality, and that's what happens in our business. And yeah. what happens usually is the people who end up calling me are so far underwater they they're either talk to a guy or go out of business, and it doesn't have to be that way, right? I love to talk to people when they're when they're before they have those issues, right? That would be yeah. so refreshing. <laughs> but yeah, it's okay. I can help you get out of that knot. That's what I do. Right. So the, I think the key thing that people need more than anything is direction is, and, and it's a business plan, right? Why don't people write a business plan? Well, it's hard to commit to that. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's, it feels like we got to commit to one girl for the rest of our life. Right. Like it, it's, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. a big jump. 
And when you start thinking yeah. about who do we want to serve, it's so much easier to say, well, I'll just print for anybody, right? Well, how do you market that? It's hard to market that. And so when we start thinking about, you know what, I want to print for uh, rock bands and do their tour merch, it's so, or whatever, hockey teams, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. so much easier to pick a lane because now you know where those people are. You know where they hang out or what associations they belong to or where they are on social media or whatever, right? It's so much easier when you have a bullseye that doesn't move because yeah. then you can aim at it. You can focus at it. That's what a business plan is. So if you think about your ideal business plan, it's your ideal customer knowing the quantity they buy, when they buy, how much they buy, what is the profit on that? What's the most profitable thing that we can give them? Also, what else can we sell them? I call that the, would you like fries with that strategy, right? So if we're yeah. selling them a t-shirt, we can sell them a hat, we can sell them bumper stickers, we can sell them a banner, we can sell them a bunch of other stuff if it's in alignment with what that person needs, right? And that's how we raise our ticket prices, right? Or, or yeah. your or your sales price, right? But what happens generally is people don't start with any of that, right? There's no uh, there's no real thought and thinking to it. It's more reactionary. It's like, oh, uh, I can make a bunch of cool stuff. That's great, right? That's where I think people go wrong. What do you guys think about that? Does that does that resonate? I oh yeah, I think there's several things that you nailed, you know, um, first off business plan, I, I guarantee you 97, if not 98% of the people in our industry specifically that jump into this, they don't make a business plan. You know, well, they, it, they search, they go on YouTube and they start saying how to print a t-shirt and they'll pop onto our website or Ryanette's website. And it's easy just to go there and click, Oh, I want to do a starter package and figure out the actual business. They think, you know, you doing the research to find the equipment that is the business plan. But it's the yeah. farthest thing from the truth. And something yeah. else that you nailed, um, we talk about this often. You know, our industry just doesn't understand their costs. And we're always like, you look yeah. at any other industry, they're so dialed in. Whether that's, yeah. you know, the, the restaurant industry or transport, like they run the business on math. And ours is yeah. so far from it. And you, you mentioned right. how people really, really find themselves in financial binds. And you brought an interesting perspective, which I've never really thought of, but reflecting, I see it all the time. And that perspective is I look at people who start off in this industry. And as you mentioned, most of them start off in their homes, in their basements, in their garage. I would say literally, you know, 80 to 90 percent of my customers, when they start, it's in their home for the reasons that you mentioned, lower yep. overhead costs. But then they have the mentality of, hey, and I was just with a customer um, yesterday. We were just talking about this. He's like, you know, I'm thinking of moving out of my space right now because I don't feel like companies respect me that I'm working out of my home. So their mentality is I'm already at uh, a disadvantage to people that are in a brick and mortar location. So their market strategy is let me look at my larger clients, like mine personally, you know, the, the the top guys in the industry that have pricing online, let me take their pricing, let me knock mm -hmm. off 30% because oh. I can say, well, we're X amount cheaper than the other guy, and that's how they run their business. But as you Shivers mentioned- just went out my spine uh, it, with that. And it, yeah. that's like, such the wrong way to do it. Such the totally. wrong way to do it. And I see and it all it, the here's, time. Here's, Here's the right way to do it, right? First off, I want you to think about what is the profit that you want to make? How yeah. much money do you want to make? And then realistically, what are you selling, right? So you can't, like, you're starting from a garage. I want to make a million dollars. I'm going to tell you, get real, pal, right? What's the, what's the real, in reality, how many orders are you going to sell? How many uh, units is that going to be? What Who are you going to go after? You know, that type of stuff. Right. And then think about how much money you want to make profit. So there's there's three types of things you need to know. You need to know your total revenue. You need to know your gross profit and you need to know your net profit. So your gross profit. So you have your revenue, which is which imaginary discussion numbers here. Right. A hundred thousand dollars. Right. 
if it, uh, your gross profit is your cost of goods sold. If you haven't seen a PNL before, that's COGS, C-O-G-S. These are all the variable costs that you have when you're in business, right? So it's the shirts you buy. If you've got a staff, you're paying your labor. It's your ink. It's your masking tape. It's your toilet paper. It's all the stuff that you have because you're in business for that one order, right? It's cost of goods, right? Subtract that from the total revenue. Let's just say our cost of goods is $50,000 out of 100. That leaves us a gross profit of $50,000 or a 50% gross profit, right? You follow me, right? Yep. Yep. So our overhead or our expenses is the other thing you have to have on your P&L. It's usually expenses. These are the costs that you incur regardless if you have any sales. So this is your rent. This is your overhead. This is your light bill. This is uh, your insurance, the equipment payment that you have to make. The stuff that you're going to have already, maybe you got to pay for a website, whatever, right? This is the yep. stuff that you're going to have anyway, right? Regardless if you have sale one or two or 10, you're paying this money out. It's always so there. let's just say in our, our, our situation here, our example, that that was $30,000. We would subtract $30,000 from the $50,000. We would have a gross profit of $20,000 or 20%. And so... When we're thinking about our pricing here, right? Here's some things that you guys should consider. First off, what should our net profit be as a percentage? We're aiming, yep. it could be anything. We're aiming for 20%, we're aiming for 30%, we're aiming for 40%, whatever it's going to be, right? I want you to figure that out and then work all your numbers out from that, up from that, right? Because that's going to help you determine what your pricing should be. Now, here's the kicker is um, not everybody will pay higher pricing, right? Mm -hmm. There are some people, it, you know, they're just made of money. It doesn't matter what it is. They'll write you a check for it because you're saving them time or you're making them money or whatever that is. These are the best customers to have, okay? These are the hardest ones to get. The closer you get to zero in your price, the easier it is to sell, okay? But now you're a commodity, and so what happens is there's a lot of sharks feeding on that bloody whale in the ocean, right? And so what yeah. happens is you've got a lot of competition for that commodity stuff because it's really hard uh, to break out of higher value pricing. So this is schools. This is... The, the people that everybody always wants, that one type of customer in wherever you live, that, that usually go to commodity pricing, right? Yeah. So let me ask you, when you're writing your business plan and you're detailing your target of who you're going after, are you trying to be the commodity guy, right? Are you trying to be um, the high price guy, right? Are you going to be Motel 6, right? Or are you going to be the Waldorf Astoria, who are you going to be in reality, right? Yeah. Every industry, every product, every service has these different levels, right? You've got, yep. you know, a bargain basement um, place to, to go economy shop, like, um, you know, uh, Dollar Value, Dollar General. I don't think they have that in Canada, but, and then you got Saks Fifth Avenue, right? So where are your customers shopping? Who are you in line with, right? People pay more for things all the time, all right? People pay lots of money for a screen-printed shirt. They'll pay $150 for a screen-printed shirt. I know that yeah. because I've seen what Supreme sells. Yeah, I've yeah. seen what on the Vans website, right? These are, these are expensive T-shirts. Is it any different than the T-shirt you're going to print out of your garage? Not much, no, no. The value is when what somebody is willing to pay for it. Are you in alignment with that? This is the reason why we need a business plan. So we know who we're going after. What do these people like? What is their problem you're solving for them? Right. And then we can build our pricing based on that. And we're not copying some idiot's website uh, pricing because how do you even know that that company is profitable? Yeah. Right. We're going to build it for us. And we're going to put the money in it that we need to expand and buy equipment and get a bigger place and hire people and whatever, and have a better website. 
all that is paid for by the customer, but it has to be included in their price. So this is the reason why you have to do your homework. You have to know what you're doing and how much things cost. And when you make a, a, one thing you guys all should know is your cost per impression, right? So to me, I define an impression as a unit of work. It has nothing nothing about how many colors. It's about the unit of work, right? So a 100-piece yeah. job front and back, right, on two, 200, right? Uh, uh, front and back is 200 impressions, right? Yep. So how much did it cost you per impression for that? If you don't know that already, you're already lost. How are you understanding yeah. your pricing if you don't know what it costs you to do the work that you're doing? Nailed it. Right? And yeah. this is separate from how we mark up the garment or the tote bag or the umbrella or the whatever you're printing on, right? Yeah. So, uh, like, I don't know. Did I explain that well? I mean, like, any questions? You know your audience better than I do. No, I think that's very well explained. And, and like, for me, as a shop owner and now getting my feet into data and understanding all these things and really implementing all these systems in place and, and just being more business savvy because of the years that I've had in my belt, I wish I understood this when I started the business, right? Uh, I was lucky to have a car wrap company that was profitable before we started the apparel company eight years ago. Right. And um, that enables us to go through years where we weren't profitable in the, in the screen print shop, right? Um, we, I wanted to, to be good at everything and, and anything that people called me for. And I wanted to do water-based stakes, embroidery, patches, sewing, everything. And my goal was just to be good for large retail brands. And I, I nailed that, but I wasn't making any money because I wanted to be a jack of all trades, but I was really yeah. master of none. Right. Um, yeah. I didn't understand the pricing and understand the, the data behind it. I didn't have systems in place. So my operators weren't efficient because there was no data being calculated anywhere. I was being successful signing those big clients and it was pretty much an ego side of, my, like, of me that wanted to get those jobs. And that was my business plan, right? I wanted to just go and acquire those clients, but I, I wasn't smart enough at that time. And I didn't understand enough the business side of it to, to be profitable doing those jobs yeah. because when I was looking at it and calculating the data around it, it was profitable, yeah. but it wasn't profitable to have my staff there just wait at the end of the oven and not do anything and fold. 25,000 shirts for 75 cents manually, right? I, I need to have a bagger, but I didn't have the volume to get an automatic folder. I just had that one order. It made sense when I calculated for just that one order, but afterwards it didn't make sense, right? So you have to calculate your whole business plan throughout what you, you can actually produce throughout a year and the volume they get in as well. And, yeah. and, and maybe put those egos, ego jobs aside. And, and right, I, I say this to my team and my brother all the time now is like, what we're doing right now is we're building the foundation for the business we want to be in five, 10, 20 years. It's not for what we want to be this year. So if you, if you think about construction, right, they're going to build a foundation for a 10 story building or for a hundred story building. It's completely different. So depending on your business plan, or where you want to go, that foundation is going to be different, right? So we know where we're going now with on demand and the business side of being fulfillment going into large volume it's completely different than what we were doing before. And we streamlined, we, we eliminated a lot of the stuff that we used to offer. We don't yep. do ham tags, patches anymore. Like it's simple. It's DTF, DTG, front and back screen printing and embroidery on caps and beanies. That's it. Like mm -hmm. I, so, I know, I know we can where do you a can lot make of money. stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah it, like, I think and, it's that's important. What we're good at. There's a word that I think people don't use enough in this industry. And that word is no. I know it. I was going to say no. <laughs> No, yeah. no, the, yeah. the answer is no. Hey, yeah. can, can 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 you print uh, my logo on these Lululemon yoga pants? Yeah, is that what you normally do with stuff like that? Uh, is yeah. it, or is this is because you you're specialized in these weirdo orders that come in? The answer is yes. Uh, can, I don't know. Can I get one of these and ruin it? Well, these things are one hundred and twenty dollars a piece. No, you can't ruin it. The answer is no. Yeah. And, and okay. I guess I guess if you can figure out how to do that, and that could be your own market, and, and you can have a really good product well, market fit just for that. Well, just think and, about this. Just think about this. So it, you've got an order of 100 of these, yeah. okay? And you ruin one of them. Mm -hmm. Now that order is no longer profitable. Yeah. All right? So, it's, it's, so, there's a, there, so you have to charge enough. So yes. if you make a mistake – 
you're not eating, you're not eating all your profit in that. And yep. chances are sometimes the profit isn't in that because the customer won't pay it. This is why you have to learn to say no sometimes. Yep. And yeah. a lot of people get into serious trouble with some really high dollar things because they are out of their element and they should just say, you know, I would really love to do that, but that's not what we really do here. Yeah. Right. And, I, uh, and I, I had go ahead, very, very similar experience to, to Sean, you know, when, when I started my business in my garage doing POD with brothers, I mean, at that time it wasn't POD. It was, we were making funny t-shirts, selling them on Etsy, printing hundreds of those things a day, selling t-shirts at $22 US on a Gildan 5,000. We were making money hand over fist, right? Gets yeah. to a point you're like, oh, look how much money I'm making in my garage, you know? Uh, I want to take this to the next level. And like Sean said, it becomes an ego thing. When I was in my garage, my dream was I want to print for Redbubble, right? That's what I want to do. I want to be the DTG guy for Canon and Redbubble. And uh, I ended up landing that account. You know, I went to the US and literally the trade show Long Beach and I started asking everybody, hey, do you know Redbubble, Redbubble? And eventually one of them was like, yeah, actually I know Redbubble. And they introduced me. Fantastic company, amazing to work with. They flew into Canada with their team. They met me and they took a, you know, a big risk working with me. I was new into the industry. I had, I think at that time, only six brothers. We ended up buying a Cornet and then later on several more. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a lot of volume with Redbubble. It was, you know, 10 to 15 times as much. And you can make an excellent living printing for a client like that, but you need to be really dialed in because as you mentioned, yep. You know, you start printing on hoodies that are 30 bucks and you're printing thousands of units a day. I'm not going to you know, say exactly what it's for, but it's not a lot as opposed to when we're selling a Gildan 5000 ourselves direct to the customer for 22. Man, I can mess up 10 percent and I'm still going to be profitable. So that's something that we yeah. learned very quickly. Hey, you know what? The watching and this applies to screen printers, watching your press spin or having all day long or having, you know, 30 machines pumping DTG for you doesn't mean you're going to make money. And, you know, Sean mm -hmm. has taken that approach as well. He, uh, you know, he, he's really moved away from printing those very high volume, uh, low margin orders and focusing on, you know, premium clients and simplifying his processes, yeah. like he said. And, you know, to the whole point of yeah. saying no, I agree. And, and that translates even to my business. But the problem is, I think a lot of people, especially when they don't, when they're starting out, they don't have the confidence in their business yet. So they become people. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. We'll just yeah. take anything and everything because we need the money. Right. Yeah. And they don't so know you, how they're so going to do it. To, to yeah. a, a really crass way of saying it is we'll just prostitute ourselves. We don't care. We'll do whatever. Right. And, totally. And then what happens is you, you're so underwater. Right. And, and one of the things I think a lot of people do is they're looking to keep their presses spinning you know, you hear that a lot, right? So they start going down the road of being a contract printer yeah. and they don't understand what that really means. And they don't understand that you're not making any money on that job, right? And yeah. then for the, uh, one of the things that I really wish people would do is really take a hard look at what you're saying yes to. And then what are the hidden costs of that? And, and like, so both of the shops that I ran we're contract printers, and I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that when you're competing with the larger shops, you know, I mean, I was buying um, 400 gallons of white ink a month, right? Just that, just that one thing, right? And not to mention emulsion and da, 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 you know, there's a lot of stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. My costs are completely different than yours when you're running one auto. And so you see this a lot on Facebook where they go, how are they printing it at that cheap? I can't even buy the stuff at that expense. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, uh, when I'm buying white ink for $17 gallon, dollars a gallon, what are you buying it for? Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and so my costs are completely different because it's all based on volume. And yeah. so uh, the, the thing that I would really like let people understand is that when you start filling up your production schedule with contract stuff because we got to keep our presses spinning. A lot of times you're just a, the hamster in the wheel, not making any money. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so let's think about this for a minute. Right. And just use discussion math. I like discussion math. Let's say you get a dollar and you make a dollar on that print. Let's even just say that that's a dollar profit. Usually it's not, but let's just say it's a dollar profit. When you sell direct to a customer, let's just say you're making 
$10 profit on that job per shirt, right? Yep. It's the same work. Okay. But yeah, the is. contract stuff just comes into like the, the waves in the ocean. Like there's just, that just comes in, right? Yep. Just comes in. She just keeps coming in, just keeps coming in. And what happens is your production schedule gets filled and filled and filled with this job, these jobs where you're making a dollar and it feels like we're really busy all the time. Look at everything. Look how we're, we're it's going crazy. Okay. It's yeah, going crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what we're not doing? If we did less of that and more of the direct work, we're making 10 times more from the same effort. Yeah. So would you rather make a dollar or would you rather make $10? You still got to make the screen. You still got to set it up. You still got to print it. You still got to box it up. You still got to ship it. You still got to do all that stuff. But, but of course, the reason why people don't do that is because that $10 job you know, again, it could be any amount of profit, but that $10 job is harder to get. Yeah. Because now you're a hunter and you have to go out in the woods and track the deer and figure it out. And you got to get the deer. You got to bag the deer. You got to bring it back to the campfire. You got to skin it and cook it up and eat it. Right. That's so much harder to do than just stuff landing in your lap. Yeah. Yeah. Hunter no, so. So but it's true. the outcome that we're looking for, guys, right? Yep. Yeah. That's uh so we we literally we never got into screen printing. We would only do DTG full foam. We looked into getting screen printing towards when I was I was planning on exiting the company. But um, you know, we would do uh just the POD fulfillment for our, our own shops, and we would basically yeah. have large, you know, these large licensee companies that would hit me up once in a while and say, Zach, listen, I got a 11 color job. Um, it's uh, 2000 pieces. My screen printer is not gonna have time to do it. Do you want to bang it out for me? You know, and I'm like, okay. And they're like, what's my price? I'd be like, you know, it's, it's this. And they're like, oh no, we can't do that. Did you see how much volume I'm giving you? I'll, we'll give it to you for 450. I'm like, no, listen, it's not worth it for me. You know, by the time I, I remove my ink cost, my labor cost, there's nothing left. Why am I going to print and make 50 cents a shirt? And print 2000 yeah. if I print 100 shirts, yeah. right? And I make 15 yeah. bucks a shirt. So that's so, something that I had to learn all early on. And it actually continued that, that mindset continued to grow with me at RB Digital. When I joined RB Digital, um, Kevin Price is our president, is a fantastic mentor of mine. Um, he basically, you know, when, when I got in, I had that mentality. I want to grow the business, grow it. Let's get every account, all the big accounts. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, get pricing and they want to work with me and Zach, listen, you, you hit this pricing and the business is yours. And I would go to Kevin and be like, Hey, listen, I know the margins are really low, but you know, it's a great account and, and they're going to buy a lot from us a lot. And, and similar to what you said, it's like, you got to know who your client is. And he would tell us, look, we, we have, we're at all the trade shows. We invest heavily into technicians. We have more technicians than anyone else in the company. You know, we, we advertise on our websites. We're in all the magazines. We can't afford to be in that business. We always want to be very competitive. We're never going to charge more than the fair market rate, mm -hmm. but there's also a sh threshold where you have to say, Hey, this business is not healthy for me. I can't allocate 20% of my warehouse to a product that I'm, I'm literally just flipping dollars. So yeah. that kind of mindset that I had there. Um, you know, I had to continue in this business. And I think that's something that that mindset translates into any business. You know, it's not just yeah. our industry. Right. Right. So 100%. here's a here's a thought experiment for for you guys watching right now. You could be a screen printer. You could run a heat press. You could have embroidery. DTG doesn't matter. Okay, Do, it, it works the same. Right. I want you to take yesterday's yesterday's production. And I want you to add up all the, the, the revenue for each of those jobs, okay? Whatever it is. It's $2,000, it's $10,000, whatever it is. And then I want you to divide that by the amount of time that you spent producing that. It's six hours, it's eight hours, whatever it is, right? This yep. is your revenue per hour, okay? Mm -hmm. And then what I want you to think about is whatever that is, right? And let's just use... Again, easy discussion math, okay? So let's say that average is out to $300 an hour, okay? And I like that number because I, I, I'm not a math whiz. I'm an artist. That's a different side of the brain, right? And so that's $5 a minute, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime you're thinking about your shop, right? If you do this as an exercise, this is your job for real, what you bring in, and this could be an embroidery job. This could be a screen print job, whatever, right? 
I want you to do the math and figure out what you're making a minute, right? And then I want you to think about all the downtime you have during your day where you're not actually decorating anything, mm -hmm. right? This is in between jobs and transition. This is when you're looking for the underbase screen. Somebody forgot to mix PMS 286 blue and you got to go mix a bucket of it. You can't find the DTFs because they're buried in a box somewhere because you're unorganized, whatever. You're not making money. So this is the reason why we need processes and we need to be measuring this stuff and we need to know what our downtime percentage is and whatever. Because if you know what your average order is, this is how you can get more handled in a day if you solve yep. that downtime thing. But moreover, this is a really great exercise for you to think about what is our minimum here? And why is it that number? Because if we make more money when we're decorating bigger jobs, because everything is spinning, right? We yep. make mm -hmm. less money in between things. We make more money when we're decorating things. So we should really be thinking about decorating larger orders. This is a different, this is a shift in mentality of clients that you're going after. What you realize is um, now you're actually money per hour that you're trying to generate actually goes up because you're no longer selling that 16 piece four color job because your minimums are higher. Like, like I know a shop in California, his minimum is 144 pieces. I know a guy who's since retired uh, in Tennessee, his minimum used to be a thousand pieces. Why? It's because it's not worth their time to do anything less. And yeah. they cultivate clients that give them the, the, the larger jobs. Okay. And this is a going after things and selling it the right way and trying to look at your data. You know, Sean, you're talking about data, right? So, do you have a dashboard set up in your shop where you're really understanding this stuff and you're every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year, you're looking at this stuff. And best of all, remember, it's our net profit we're trying to get to. We compare where we are to where we want to be. And it's a binary thing, right? Either you're, either you're doing it right or you're off the mark and we got to make a change. Yeah, okay? 100%. So what are we doing here, right? And I, I think, again, we were talking when we started the show about a lot of people when they start off, they don't know this stuff. And it's okay. It's part of your journey. It's yeah. Learning is part of your journey. Yeah. Now that you've listened to all this, right, my question to you, dear viewer, is what are you going to do about it, right? You can't, now that you know this information, nobody, you can't say that, well, nobody told me. Right. Yeah. Are you going to do something about it to change your business for the better? Or are you going to lump along and be unprofitable again this year, just like you were last year? That's the question. <laughs> you nailed Amen. it. And it's, that's the question. It's it's I think it's not easy for us to say when we're, we're talking about this and we've been over that hill. Right. Um, because I know I was I was at the bottom of that hill a few years back and I, I wanted to figure out these things. And I didn't know how because I was tired to have my other company pay the bills for this company, right? Um, I wanted this company to be successful and run on its own, and I didn't want to to keep writing checks, right? So I had to figure these things out, and it was a big kick to our, to my ego to to to, ha to have to learn these things and, and starting to say no, right? And when I understood that this wasn't profitable and why, because I had data that proved me that it wasn't profitable, mm -hmm. then it was even more fun to start saying no to more things, right? And yeah. eliminate those all those small things that didn't make us profitable. Yeah. I was like, no, we're going to respect ourselves and we're not going to do this because down the road, we're going to acquire that volume of what we're really good at and we're going to be profitable. And it took, us about, it took us about six months to flip the whole business around and be fully profitable, right? And so it's it was a six months of pain and not really having to trust the process of understanding what I was going through and where we wanted to go. And believing that what we were doing was right. Yeah, and right. once we did that and we got over that hill, over that hump, 
I started to breathe and actually trust what we were doing when we were going in the right direction. Yeah. And that's when you can hit full throttle. And then you don't even understand it. Why? But your confidence just rises and you start speaking to client and they see right. that and they just want to attach to that. Right. And I feel mm -hmm. that's when you get a really, really good product market fit. And when I say pro product market fit is think about BlackBerry and the iPhone when the iPhone came out. Right. BlackBerry thought they had a really good product market fit. They didn't want to change. But the iPhone came and it was just better. So when you get into that confidence zone, you, you start being that iPhone compared to everybody else because yeah. you know what you're really good at. And then you're not there selling. You're there suggesting your client as to actually what he really needs because you know what you can deliver on and what you can't. Yeah. So that's where you're going to be completely different than everybody else. And you're going to be super profitable. So that was like, for me, that's my biggest asset right now is like, yeah. if you're starting trust the process of what you, you want to do and keep doing that and focus on that. And like you were, we were talking about contract printers earlier and you were saying the shop you, you ran had what, 16 autos, right? If you're 16, running 16, four, four manuals, like two shifts. That's crazy. Right. So you're thinking about that. You're running all those machines at the same time. So if you have one job that goes down and right, you're scrap, you're, you're, you're making a hundred shirt, you make a mistake. You have 13 other machines that are running that can, pump out the money just to pay for that job. When you yeah. run one, one auto, it's going to well, take you 13, 14 days to pay for that job. When the other contract shop is paying you for it in the same day. Like you have to yeah. think about yeah. these things. Well, let me it's tell not, you, we kept, we kept track of everything. Right. And, and you have so, to. so I had a, uh, Matt, I had a spreadsheet. We had what I call discrepancy codes. And yeah. uh, so I tracked every penny. And so uh, I, I ran the shop with a 5.4 Lean Six Sigma number, which is wow. uh, uh, it's is about defects per million opportunities, right? And so, That's crazy. Uh, and we were we were all about tracking error rates and understanding how to solve that. And I'm, that's a whole other discussion. But the, yeah. the idea here, though, is you're if you're not measuring. You know, you, you can't manage what you don't measure, right? So if you're not measuring your errors, how many errors did we make this month? Okay. And yeah. I'm not just talking about printed shirts. I'm talking about uh, the the uh, the information was put in wrong because purchasing bought the wrong shirts. That's an error. Yeah. I'm talking yep. about we burned the screens on the wrong mesh. That's an error, right? Yep. We mixed the, the ink didn't match because we didn't mix the ink right. That's an error. We're tracking all of that. Right. And then and then what happens is when you start looking at this stuff and you start holding people accountable and you start giving them better tools and better training to eliminate these errors, what happens is you virtually don't make any errors. Right. Yeah. Did we still make errors? Yes. Did we still do stupid things? Yes, because we're people. People do stupid things all the time. You yeah. know, I do. I do stupid things every day. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to do them. <laughs> But that's just because I'm a person, right? And I get distracted yeah, yeah. or whatever. That happens on your shop floor all the time. So what are the checks and balances that you have built in so you don't have that problem, right? This is what I'm talking about, right? And yep. uh, so it's really just about um, uh, putting in place the things that you need to do things, right? And one of my favorite business books is this book called Extreme Ownership by this guy named Jocko Willink who is an ex-Navy uh, SEAL lieutenant commander. And um, he co-wrote it with this guy named uh, Leaf. And um, my favorite business quote comes from that book, which is, it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate, right? So do we tolerate mediocrity, <laughs> right? Is it okay yeah. just to, you know, it's not really in registration, but we'll ship it anyway? Yeah. Right. What do we tolerate? Do we tolerate people coming in late or, um, you know, you're in the bathroom and there's paper towels on the floor ne right next to the trash can? Do we tolerate that? Right. Do we tolerate somebody warming up their shrimp in their microwave? Because you know what that smells like. <laughs> right. It's gross. Yeah. Yeah. Do we tolerate this stuff? Right. Or <laughs> do we operate yeah. like professionals? You know, the varsity wants to play with other varsity players. They don't want to play with the JV. So why is the JV on your team? Yeah. Hmm. Right. And so this is you as your business owner, as your leader. What are we doing here? Right. And so, th of course, we don't have to be jerks. Don't buy us to be yelling or anything. It's just there's a, some companies have a culture 
of excellence and other people don't. Right. Yeah. And this could be your shop right now. If you're watching right now, this could be your shop. It's what you tolerate is what happens. Yeah. yeah and you set expectation, I think, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, it's like, where do you draw the line in the sand, right? Like you said, in the beginning, yeah. it just starts as the guy, you know, crumpling up the, the paper towel and throwing the bin and missing it. Later on, it ends up being, you know, ink that's on the, uh, uh, you know, on the press. It doesn't get wiped down. It just snowballs from there. And if, yeah. if you don't draw the line in the sand, where does it end? It just keeps getting worse and worse to the point yeah. where nobody cares, right? Exactly. You know, Marshall, so, I've, like I, I've mentioned in the past, I, I've been, you know, there was a shop I was in once. And I was walking literally through the shop and my shoe came off my foot because there was so much dry. Oh. It literally came off like I, I was hopping around in a sock trying to, so, you know, put it back on. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. So like, you know, I do a lot of I go to a lot of shops, you know, and um, there's there's two things I always check out. First is the employee bathroom in the shop. Uh -huh. Right. Does it look like a nasty gas station? That's why I want to know, because that hmm. shows up everywhere else in the shop. If it's immaculate, I know that they're a good shop, right? If it's really gross, they've got some issues. And the other thing I look for is uh, if I'm in the screen print area, right, do I see the print on the board? Because if hmm. I see the print on the board, I know they know nothing about screen tension. And uh, and then I need to go have a deep dive into the screen room and start looking at that stuff. And those are just the two, just walking in. This is what I'm yeah. looking for, right? Yeah. Head on a swivel looking at, right? And I'm also looking, is it just lots of clutter? You know, it's just, just gross stuff everywhere. You know, I went to a shop once and they were considering buying a new building, right? And um, so I was, in, and they held a lot of inventory. They were a major supplier for somebody and, and I was going through here and I was looking at the racks. I'm like, what is all this stuff up on the racks? All these skids of stuff. It's like, oh, that's all left over. And I was like walking around with like four or five, six people. And I go, okay, everybody pull out a $5 bill. We're going to, we're going to count how many of these skids uh, we can dump. Yeah. Because they're no longer active anything. Right. Wow. And the closest to that going over wins the pot. Right. It was like 30 bucks. Right. And uh, what do you think the number was? Any guesses? This is about a 60,000 square foot warehouse. 140 skids. 216. Oh, my gosh. Are you Crazy. serious? Two, and they were going to buy a whole nother building because they didn't have anywhere to put Jeez. stuff. That's crazy. Okay. So I yeah, save them lots of money. Insane. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like so it's like what I go on here though is what happens is we walk around this stuff every day, right? And because yeah. we're like you know like the fishmonger is nose blind to the smell of fish, right? We walk around this stuff every day because it's just there, right? Yeah. I, I went to the shop one time. This is a pretty famous story. I talk about it all the time, and the accounting department went digital. And they moved all like eight or 10 filing cabinets out to the warehouse because they didn't need them anymore. And where do they put them? Right there in the middle of the production floor. And of course, the production people didn't object. And so now they're walking around these filing cabinets all day. And those things have been sitting there for like two months before I got there. Crazy. How many extra steps did that create for that yeah. shop? Because nobody's thinking. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know? I even see that from the equipment perspective. I go into some shops and I, I always like to walk around. You know, I, I don't want to just see the machines I, uh, like you. I look on the wall, see what's going on there. And some, I remember one shop, they had like 12 heat presses, like literally in pieces, you know, uh, underneath a table, big table, big row. And I'm like, uh, what's with all those? I'm like, ah, those are all the, you know, heat presses have been dying. We just kind of chuck them, kind of, you know, grown the collection over the te last 10 years. And then to me, it's like, first of all, you're never going to get around to fixing that cheap heat press. So yeah. either fix it or dump it. But then it makes it easy for you to say, oh, I got my heat press and there's a problem. Let's just put it in the graveyard because that's what we do. And instead of taking pride of every piece of equipment that you have and saying, oh, this has an issue. Well, we yeah. fix our problems. And if not, yeah. we kill it. We replace it. Yeah. You don't just keep a graveyard. It, again, it all comes down to company culture, right? Yep. Yeah. You want to you see my hackles go up? Go into the ink kitchen, and if you can see fingerprints on the wall, you know they're a slobby shop, right? Mm -hmm. 
So we get ink in our hand because we're mixing the ink. And instead of like cleaning our hands properly or wearing gloves, we just do the hand smear on the oh, wall because, you know, that's we think we're Jackson Pollock or something. I don't know. It's like a five year old baby. Clients, when the, when <laughs> no. the client, yeah. When the client comes in, it's like these people are gross. Yeah. It's right. True. And I've been to shops. I'm sure you guys have, too, that are surgical room clean. Yeah. yeah. The floor glistens. It's beautiful. Right. That's how it needs. Like, Every how time it they do shop. stuff, angels sing. It's perfect. That's yeah. that's what I love. That's effort. That's leadership that creates, yeah. that, you yeah. know. I think it goes into com company culture too, right? At first it starts with leadership and then it grows more than leadership. It goes into the company culture and then your staff starts doing it. So now the new hires come in they see everybody do it. So they're not, not going to clean up. They're not, not going to like clean up the ink that they fall on the floor. And so at first it starts with leadership and then the company grows, it goes into company culture and then everybody else starts doing it. So now that's just the way we run and that's the way we implement things. But there is a stepping stone as, as the leader makes, needs to take a decision and needs to make take that action, right? Um, and that's how I always ran my shop. I'm, I'm super picky about these things. And, yeah. and it's pro it probably comes down from my mom and my dad being super picky when we were younger, younger at home and working with my dad. He, he told me all the time, like, if you want a door to close and it's not closing, install the yield on it. It's going to close by itself, right? right. So mm -hmm. you lead by example and you do things what, the way you want it to be done. Um, yep. and, and I've always put a lot of pride into that and like Zach can attest to it. Like he comes in shop and you can eat on the floor. It's, that's what we want that's it great. to be. And I don't that's go and clean it. Right. The, yep. the team cleans it because they're proud. They're proud of it. So I think that's a, but that being a, said, a nice if you're walking thing. around and you saw some garbage on the ground, you're picking it up too. You know, uh, you see some, 100%. there are some business owners, they walk around, they don't care. You know, I, I have a, a, a client avid actually no avid. And um, every time I'm walking around with Ephraim, yeah. their, you know, the C CFO, he's walking up and down with me and he sees a little tag on the ground. He stops and he picks it up and like he's collected by the time we're done walking, he's got, you know, four or five things in his pocket that he's picked up and it just right. and they got, I don't know, 150 employees there, if not more. And he takes the time when he's walking around with me to, to do that. Right. And yeah, right. Uh, it's leading by example, you know, fix what bothers you and lead by example, which is something I think yeah, everybody needs right. to do. So exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, it reminds me of a, uh, there's a famous uh, psychology study they did with chimpanzees. And I forget there's a famous name for it. I forget <laughs> what it is. But they had a big pile of bananas hanging from the ceiling. And they had a ladder, right? And any and when a monkey climbed up the ladder to get the banana, they would spray him with the fire hose, right? And then yeah. anytime somebody went the ladder, they spray him with the fire hose. And then, so what would happen is uh, all the monkeys didn't like getting hit with the fire hose. So anybody that touched the ladder, all the monkeys would attack the other monkey that was trying to go up the ladder. Okay. And eventually they, they, they kept rotating new monkeys, in, right? So the new monkey would come in and didn't know the deal with the ladder and start going it up and they would just attack it because they didn't want to get the fire hose. And then what happened is they quit. They didn't do the fire hose anymore and if you touch the ladder, the monkeys would just attack you, right? Oh, my god! And then nobody understood why, but this is just the – you've heard this before, the way we've always done it, right? Yep. Yeah. And so when anybody talks about that kind of a thing, I just, I'm just reminded about these monkeys not knowing why they're doing what they're doing because That's somebody so five years ago made some decision. Hmm. And so if you go to a shop and you ask them why you're using this emulsion or this tape That's or this screen or – this ink or what, whatever you're doing, nobody knows the answer. And what they say is, well, this is the way we just do things here, right? They, yeah. But wow. nobody's ever challenged this, you know, maybe there's been a better product that's been invented <laughs> in the last five or six years. I wonder if we, I wonder if we just tried something else, we could like cut that down in half, right? T typically that doesn't happen yeah. because you know, we're, we're a room full of monkeys that don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. And um, I think it comes back down to like wanting to, to, to be better. Right. And like, there's one thing I really want to touch on because I, I've seen you dabble a lot into that industry now. And well, like, I'm always playing with stuff. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. And like for us, like for me, I'm, I've became obsessed with AI and the way it changed our business, just using it to vectorize artwork, the way I use it to automate emails, things like that. Right. 
Yep. We always want to get better. And I know you're really, really big, especially with mentoring and designing with AI. Yeah. You want to jump. My new bromance, about... man. Mid journey. There we go. I want to, I want to hear your <laughs> thoughts on it. I want to hear where do you well, think it's going to go? How shops can use it, how we can make it faster for us. It changes tremendously, especially the art team, the part, like the art department. What, what well, do you think I'm about a, that? I'm a next and address the fear, Marshall, before you jump in, address the fear. Yeah. Cause it's one thing that, a lot of people yeah. are very scared to do because A, it's the unknown, yeah. but B, people have this mentality. I'm not going to get into AI. That's going to kill jobs. Every, I'm going to, you know, no one's no, going to need graphic designers. That's silly. Well, it, 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 it could kill jobs, but let me, let me address fear first, right? So fear is an acronym. Do you know what the acronym stands for? No. Nope. Fear stands for false evidence appearing real. Hmm. Okay. False that's evidence good. appearing real. We don't really know. We don't really know what this is, but you know what? We're not going to do it because I don't like it, right? So you know yeah. what you sound like when you say, I don't trust AI, I don't trust mid-journey, I don't know, it's whatever. You sound like that kid that won't eat his broccoli <clears throat> even though he's never tasted it. Yeah, I'm just not going to yeah. eat it because it looks like a tree. I'm not eating that, right? <laughs> uh, by the way, I don't like broccoli either, but, but it was like <laughs> one of these things that, but I've tried it, right? And yeah. the reason why I try things all the time is because you don't know, right? That's the reason why I read books. This is the reason why I talk to people. This is the reason why I'm always playing around with stuff, chat GPT and Dolly 3 and uh, whatever, uh, just goofing off with stuff. Um, you know, at one point, I never knew how to do anything. You know, who here was born with the ability to drive a car? No. Nobody. We had to walk. learn, right? <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Yeah. And here's the thing. The only way to learn to drive the car is to take it out of park. You can't mm -hmm. watch a movie. You can't read a book. You can't do anything. The only thing you can do is get it in the car, take it out of park, and have one of your parents yell at you because you don't want to hit something. Okay? And then sooner or later, sooner or later, when you avoid all the stuff, you'll learn to drive. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And then some people, of course, are better drivers than others, you know, whatever. And that's the same with everything. Some people are better cooks. Some people are better artists. Some people are better musicians. Some people are better singers. Some people are better embroiderers or whatever. It, it, printers, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So I'm an artist. I have a degree in art. Can I draw? Yes. I can draw better than most people I know, right? I can hmm. paint. My favorite thing to do is to make photorealistic watercolors. That's what I do. OK, I'm at that level. Right. But I'm also a graphic designer. I've been doing stuff for years and years and years. I still do it. You know, all the stuff that Shirt Lab, you know, all the graphics. Uh, I do all that. Yeah. Right. And I do my own things. Right. And um, so last year, about this time, February, March, I started playing around mid journey because I kind of by accident bumped into it. I don't know what you know just oh what's this let me check it out you know and i started playing around like oh this is really cool this is really neat this is really cool and i started mm -hmm. doing more and more and more and then i got to the point where it was like crack okay i couldn't <laughs> stop and i'm like this is the coolest thing ever and um i started this uh, regimen where well, as i'm drinking coffee i'm a big coffee drinker i drink about a pot of coffee a day I do all my content creation in the morning. Usually I write and do stuff. And uh, so while I'm drink, sitting here drinking my coffee, I would spend somewhere between five and 10 minutes, maybe 15. And I would make one mid journey thing a day. And I yeah. started posting on my social with that. And you can look me up. It's my name, Marshall. Yep. And I share the prompts. This is the, what I'm, this is what I did. Right. And what I'm doing is I'm playing with, the words now as a designer if you're not a designer you don't know what i'm talking about but if you are a designer you know if you're using photoshop or illustrator whatever you're using you know how to use the pen tool and the square tool and the color tool and probably the info palette tool and you can do all these uh, apply image commands and all that stuff that you've been doing forever right yep but none of that exists in mid journey it's all mm -hmm. words so it's really weird. I mean, it's mm. so weird, right? Because now your results are based on what? They're based on your vocabulary. That seems like a test. 
Okay, so if you don't have a good vocabulary, how good a result do you think you're going to get? Yeah. And so it's one of these things where you start playing around. And this is what fascinates me is because it's so damn frustrating. I want this. I can't get it. Hmm. Why is that? And I start goofing her off and playing with stuff and try and, and I would look things up. You know, Mother Google, by the way, knows all. Mother Google knows yeah. all. You look it up. Word. What does this word mean? What does that word mean? Or a thesaurus. Thesaurus is great, right? And so what's another word for this, right? So when we say, for example, the word minimalist, right? Okay, that can give you one result. What about stark or austere or spartan or simple, right? In the same prompt, those can all give slightly different images, whether that is better or worse. It's it's an aesthetic. It's up to you to decide, right? But the, the, the most fascinating thing is, is the speed at what we're creating now. Do you so mind doing, me doing one right a logo, now? Right? You know, or a picture or an illustration for a t-shirt or whatever. You know, yeah. I know how to do that. I, it takes hours to do something that's really cool, right? Can you create, can you do one? Can you go through the process right now of doing one yeah, and sharing your I'll, screen? I'll, I'll show you, you know? but I want to say, so if you yeah. haven't seen it, I want to explain what it is first. Right? Yes. So, so there's a lot of people who run this mistaken thing that mid journey or stable diffusion or Dolly three or whatever you're talking yep. about is somehow copying and pasting other people's work. No. That is not how it works. And if you hear anybody saying that, it's because they're not informed. They're coming at it out of the place that they heard something and they're just parroting something like a song lyric. They don't know what it really means. Hmm. Okay. And so let me break it down for you. Here's how it works. First off, it's all these platforms start. It's really the same thing. They start with random noise. So I want you to think, channel one on your TV with the static, right? The, the, you yep. know, if you've seen poltergeist, you know, they're here, you know, the little girl, <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah. that's the, that's what it is. It's static, right? Every word that you put in there, the word prompts, right? Are con now here's how it's trained on. These are all LLMs, which is large learning models, right? So um, mid journey, which is what I prefer, because I think it gives you the best image is trained on trillions of images on the internet. Think about every picture on the internet since the internet started. How many images are there on the internet, right? Hmm. It, it, it looked at that, right? And it yep. looks at that image and what's called an image to text pair. So when you say dog, I want a dog, there's a picture of a dog and then there's a picture that says dog, right? It hmm. understand, It matches that together. Right. So when we say dog or cloud or blue or car or shoe or whatever. Right. How many images do you think exist on the Internet for each of those words? Oh, billions. Trillions. It's unimaginable. OK. So what happens is that word is converted to an algorithm. It's a math formula. So when we say dog it's converted to numbers, a math formula. And it goes out there and it converts that random noise to a dog by some magical power. I don't know how it works. I don't care. That's how it works. <laughs> it's not copying and pasting, right? It's, it's just creating. assigning <laughs> pixels to make a dog image. Uh, and yeah. if you put the word blue to it, it's making that dog blue. Okay. Or whatever. Right. Yeah, and the it. more words you put in there, the more complicated that algorithm gets. Now, here's the thing is, if you wanted a light blue dog and you said blue and you got a real blue dog, you, did, you needed to use more specific prompts. This is the reason why I do these experiments all the time, because sometimes the words that MidJourney likes don't make any sense at all, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'll show you something in a minute. But so this is how this works. This is what's really super fascinating by it. And what happens is... If you get good at this stuff, right? And I think I'm pretty good. There's people who are probably better, but I think I'm pretty good. And what happens is you start with the ability to kind of get what you want and you could get where you want to go really extremely quickly because there's some power moves that you can make. This is what I teach at the trade shows is yeah. this stuff, right? 
I, you know, by the way, I have a, I have a newsletter that I, that I do and, and you guys can throw the link out there. And I also sure, have, uh, I do private coaching. I've done private coaching with entire art departments to teach them this stuff. Right. So you're looking at mid journey now, yes, right? There we go. Okay. Woo. We're in. All right. So, all right, just to backtrack. So uh, if you were to sign up for mid journey right now, let's say you're not using it, you're going to have to go through mid journey through discord and I'll, I'll fire that up right here. So Discord is where you used to be, uh, and MidJourney started on Discord. Like, this is the Discord channel for MidJourney, and then there's all these little newbie rooms that you'll be in, and uh, and you're at the mercy of whatever kind of crazy people or whatever they're building today is in there. If you're in that, I would recommend that you get your start your own server. I have my own server right here, right? Yep. And this is my stuff right now because I'm a power user. I don't create a mid journey much anymore. I'm over here in the mid journey alpha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is so much faster, but some of the tools that are in discord haven't populated over. So I'm sure they're going to put them in. They're just, they're, it's alpha. It's like a beta version, but better. Yeah. They're just kind of migrating some things over. Right. So, uh, I'm just going to show you what I've been working on. This is today's stuff. This is why I posted on my Instagram today. I was wanting to do a doodle looking thing, uh, like on a post-it note of like a continuous line drawing of a guy, a person. Right. So I tried to figure out the, the, um, the prompts for that. Right. And then I made all of these images, right. See all these images. I made all these images this is about uh, a minute's worth of work, okay? Wow. <laughs> All right, and, I'll, and I'll, let me show you exactly how that's done, right? So um, I'm just going to create something just brand new, right? Let's yeah. do um, let's let's pretend we need a background texture that we're going to put inside a shape that we're going to put a logo, our client's logo on, and we're going to make a DTF that's going to be inside of a circle, okay? So yeah, what like type that. of texture do we want? Like a flower, some wood grain? What what do we want to build here? You asteroid. tell me. An asteroid, really? A asteroid okay. texture. Asteroid <laughs> texture. Asteroid <laughs> texture space. Uh, we'll say uh, it's on uh, uh, Comet Trail. Uh, and we'll say... Uh, do we want it realistic? We look like a comic book. What type of what type of art do we want? What's the aesthetic on this? Realistic. Realistic. So we'll say um because Zach's uh, been in space a few times. So he knows exactly what it looked like. Every weekend. Astronomy of of inspired photography. I don't know the right word to use, but that's what we're gonna use. And then here's what we're gonna say. We're gonna give it um uh, we're going to give it a, a, some style prompts here, right? So this is power move, how I do stuff. So this is the creativity level that we're giving it, right? So That's we're going to say are. each the higher numbers we're using is more creativity, right? The lower mm. numbers, it's more like the prompts that we're using. Yep. And so when I hit go here, and I want to make sure these are squares, you know, square, okay? So when I hit go here, I'm gonna. I'm creating 44 images right now of an asteroid, just for Zach, right? Um, and then uh, it, it'll start up here in about two seconds here, and it won't take any time to render. And then what I can do is, based on the results that I get, um, we can uh, start changing and playing around, and doing some crazy stuff, right? So um, here you go. We already started. And of course, we don't know what mid journey is going to give us. That's the fun part. It could be a big asteroid, a small asteroid, uh, whatever, right? Um, and so now we're all done. So we just created 44 images of asteroids. <laughs> I, I really like that one. That was cool, That's, right? Oh, oh. Uh... And some of Crazy. these are like great, some of these maybe not so great. Um, it just depends on what you really wanted or whatever. And so what I tend to do is I'll just look these over. Now, the ones here at the bottom are more like 
this called stylized zero. They're yeah. more like, you know, exactly like the prompt. The ones that are at the top have a more create creative kind of a look to them. That's insane. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so, uh, and then these are, if you look through them, some of these could be really great. Some of these are okay. Let's just pick one and play with it. So let's say, um, uh, let's find one that, let's say this one, right? Yeah. So what we can do here is uh, right from mid journey, right? We can do very subtle. We can hit that a couple times. We can hit very strong. We'll hit that a couple times, right? We can also go in here and then we do remix subtle and we can give it a, uh, let's say, we'll say, um, uh, uh, so fiery a, sec- a second prompt from that fire, one. uh, fire comet trail, and we'll say, uh, a spaceship. Just, I don't know, I'm just playing around, right? Marshall, I have a question for you, I don't, and I'm just curious because I haven't done enough research into this. If you were to ask right now to put like Super Mario on there, can you do licensed stuff with AI, or do you have no, kind of it, have to be it, tricky? It, it, well, How does that work? So That's a whole thing. different thing. If you kind want of to worms. steal somebody's intellectual property, Mid Journey will give that to you. Really? If you want to make a Marvel character or Super Mario, it'll give it to you. Okay? Okay. Now, should you do it? The answer is no. Of course. Okay? So it uses images based on the. Uh, here we go. We'll just say. Um, we'll say Super Mario on the inter- on the asteroid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably give a Super Mario on an asteroid, okay? I'm and a, a um, Super Mario printing on an MNR Cobra on the asteroid. So, so here's the thing: <laughs> it needs it needs lots of images to understand what you're talking about. Okay. You can upload images, and really? you can start playing around with stuff. Yeah, you can upload images. Okay, so here's cool. Super Mario what? on an asteroid. It's going to deliver here in about two seconds. Okay, and. Um, there you go. What do you think? It's wow. almost done. Right. So, you know, maybe you've got the Super Mario license or you're trying to get it and you want to prove that you can design stuff. Like, how long would oh that have taken God. you to do? That's, That's insane. Crazy. Yeah. So it looks so good. I don't see, I don't like that. To me, of course. No. Can you do it? Yes. Yes, you can do it. Can you steal other people's ideas from the internet? Of course you can. People do that every day. But should you? Okay. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. This is not copying some picture that looks just like this from Super Mario. There's so many pictures on the internet of Super Mario. Like, yeah. you know, we could also do, you know, John Wick on an asteroid. And it'll give us John Wick on an asteroid, right? That's just what happens, right? But if we're doing things for real and we're trying to be ethical creatives we're not doing this stuff Mm -hmm. can you do it of course you can do it right that doesn't make it correct or or, or good or lawful right so no but uh, for example you could you could do with this you could create a really really nice simulated process print for one of the companies that brings you a picture of their beer bottle they want a nice simulated process in the background something like that so you yeah. can take that image, put oh it in the journey, gosh. say, all right, I'll, oh my, look at that. All right. That's, that's insane. insane. Like that's a poster right there. Yeah. There you go. Crazy. So John Wick's in outer space kicking ass, right? So, Oh man, I'm, I'm but, not going to sleep for a couple of weeks trying to figure this all out. This is game well, over for me. So, so what I want to, I want to do is, is like, this that's is, insane. this is to me how I would use it. Right. Yeah. So if you're thinking, okay. Let me just do this. I'll show you. Um, you saw how fast I was making those, right? Yeah. So let's yeah. say you've got a project and you need to create a parrot for a T-shirt back. That took just as long as those images I just made. Yeah. So you want to? So you're doing a uh, a thing for Rainforest Cafe, or you're doing something yeah. for uh, Luau, like a company that you do stuff with, like, uh, maybe there's a plumbing supply company is having a Luau, right? You could put their logo in Luau 2024. And that parrot took you exactly two minutes to create. And now you can just, uh, you can just separate it in Photoshop and you're done. Right. Mm-hmm. Here's what I'll tell you about using this tool. 
is that it's not perfect. Okay. So kind of the way I explain it is that mid journey is a genius four year old. It doesn't understand what you want. It doesn't mm -hmm. understand what a parrot is or a circle or it, it just, it's just matching things up and it's giving you what it think you wants. Right now is this parrot looks nice, but is that a realistic parrot feather thing? I don't know if the a parrot's feather looks exactly like that, but you know what? If I wanted to make that parrot's head red or green or whatever, I could do that in Photoshop because I know yeah. how to do that. Right. I'm not trying to make a perfect thing. I know that I can change it later afterwards because I'm going to be adding logos and doing whatever I'm going to do. Right. Um, and so this is the reason why, you know, it gives you like, if this was a football game, right. Um, you know, we catch the ball in our end zone and we run it all the way down to the seven yard line. The crowd goes crazy, but we haven't scored yet. Mm -hmm. Right. This isn't perfect. We're still going to have to goof around with a little bit, but guess what? We're on the seven yard line in two or three plays. We score a touchdown. That's what happens. That's the reason why you should do this for art departments everywhere. I've had to create this parrot and I've spent six, eight hours in Photoshop doing this. Now That's I can crazy. do it in three minutes. So okay? Marshall, let me ask a question. And I'm sure a lot of people are thinking this, who owns this image? You've created well, it you, through AI. Can you do whatever you want with it, provided that's not infringing on someone's you know, patent or trademark or likeness? How does this work now? Well, here's the thing is uh, it, anything created with AI, whether it's uh, computer code or an image like this parrot, is not copyrightable but in the U.S. anyway. I don't know about Canada because it is not made by human being. Okay, mm -hmm. now I can take this. And I can do some stuff with it. And for the majority of our industry, because we're not like Nike designers, we're just doing stuff for the local plumbing company. Nobody's going to care. And, we're, and, and in fact, if you try to copyright your stuff anyway, you know, you defending your copyright is about a hundred thousand dollars in court, right? It's just yeah. so much easier to design another thing than even worrying about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So nobody really owns this. If I make some changes to it, like I make the parrot's head red or I do something to it, and I add some logos or, you know, whatever, it's mine. Yeah. Right. And so what it really needs to happen more than anything is there needs to be more regulations and laws about how stuff that's created using AI, whether yeah. it's source code or a book manuscript or a design, is that I own that because I put the prompts in who owns the thing, how, it, what's the amount of changes you have to make until it's yours. It's just a super gray area. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's, mm -hmm. here's what I'll tell you is I'm not worried about it. I put stuff yeah. out all the time. Tons yeah. of people are making lots of money with t-shirt designs using mid journey right now. They're not worrying about it. I yeah. think if you're a major entity like Nike or Disney, you're worrying about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because you know that you might, or Harley, you know you might have to defend that, right? And um, so you could, you know. But then again, that's still hard to defend. Do, because... Here's what you can do with Mid Journey. I just put in Harley, right? So imagine, uh, here's a one color on a black t-shirt. Mm -hmm. All day, right? Is this exactly perfect chrome exhaust pipe? And what? I don't know. I'm not a, a motorcycle expert. <laughs> You know, I have no idea, right? But oh, you know, to me, feels animals. This, look, wow. this looks awesome. Yeah, right? you would sell some shirts with that, right? Hundred percent. Oh man. And uh, you know, I put, I try all kinds of different stuff. I was doing BMWs the other day. So here's BMWs, right? So is this, is this a, uh, is this the exact 2024 BMW 3 Series, right? Is it perfect? I have no idea. I'm not a BMW expert, but it looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Yeah, close to it. it looks incredible. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't so Marshall, know. I want to ask you something. Oh, I want to ask you something else. So this yep. is incredible. I'm like pretty mind blown. And we've, we haven't, I'm, I'm sure you could just dive so deep into this. And this is just talking artwork. Like you said, guys are using this for code and all that kind yeah. of stuff as well. I mean, the, the, yeah. um, it's limitless. So what someone who's starting out, they're like, Hey, I know nothing about AI. Where do I start? 
you know, what do I download? What do I read? What video do I watch? What's your recommendation? So for me with my graphic okay. designer, Rob, I want him to start using this and figuring out ways to market it, right? Yeah. What would you say here's kind of the, the path that I would walk since you've been doing it so long? Okay. okay. Thank you so much for the self-promo segue. So hmm. um, unintentional. Off, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Actually, I would recommend yeah. I would recommend you subscribe to my mid journey elevating print creativity newsletter. It's okay. midjourneyexperience.com. That's where you go. It's 12 bucks a month, 100 bucks a year. Pick, pick your poison, right? It, mm -hmm. You get a free edition that tells you how to create your account and start using Midjourney, okay? that's That one's for free. If you like the first one, then you can subscribe or maybe you just want to subscribe off the bat, right? I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people around the world subscribing to this newsletter. And what we have is inspiration plus stories plus videos plus how to's each newsletter is different it publishes every single week right it's just it's just loaded with how to do things and mm -hmm. how to do things faster and better and to get you thinking and i give you the prompts we give you a bunch of stuff so you can try it in your office or home or wherever you're doing it right um and so the the thing with anything um it's just like learning to drive the car, guys, right? Yeah. You got to like sit behind the wheel, take it out of park, take it on the road, start yeah. driving it. And that's the, how you're going to learn how to use mid journey. It's the same way is by doing daily experiments. And, and okay. like, uh, and since I'm sharing my screen, let me sh share this with you. I have, um, I've got a, uh, I keep a spreadsheet, um, uh, now, Marshall, that I've tried. How long, how long's the mid journey been going on for? I'm sure you have tons of episodes. It's about like, a year. So someone jumping into it, do they get access to all episodes? Like, is there a stepping stone, or is it kind of well, like? No. You're... Well, so how my how my uh, how my newsletter works is it, regardless of when you sign up, you start off with the first one, right? Yeah. And then oh, you okay. get the Very second nice. one, you get the third one. So there's people right now who are way past that. Um, yeah. mm. And you can't like read ahead because it's just, it's an evergreen cycle thing, right? You just yeah. Very start reading. Cool. And that then, um, so what I've done is when I try new stuff, I add it to my spreadsheet here and I've got all oh, I'm, I'm past like 850 of these. <laughs> oh. um, and this is how I've, I, I've tried all these things just to see what happens. So like, here's one, I don't know how well you can see, right? So rap, rap what does what does rap aesthetics do? Okay, I don't know. Let's check it out. Let's say dragon rap aesthetics. Go right. Tupac dragon. This is the fun part is that you can just do the goofiest things in the world to see what happens because you you don't know, and it's mm -hmm. so much fun just to put things that don't even belong together and just see what happens. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with this. What do you think is going to happen? You, you got like maybe five seconds till it pops I up. I think it's going to be a Tupac dragon. Tupac. <laughs> Biggie Small sitting on a dragon. Oh, I... Hey. Oh. That's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. All right. Wow. So, there you go. So here we go. We're we're at the the Chinese sculpture. Look, look how cool that look how cool that one is. That's look, crazy. Look how cool that is. That's insane. Insane. Okay. Those look, colors that could got, be insane it's on it's a shirt. Even got the uh, the wood block stamp here, like you might yeah. have, right? Wow. And of course, people are going to say, "Hey, that copied that from somewhere." I take anything I've designed and do a reverse Google lookup because yeah. I've done it. You're not going to find it. You can't. Okay, so that was a, so. Because if someone else uses this... random, remember this started off with random noise. All four of these images start off with random noise. It's only got three words in it. It's my the random okay, noise but... is what makes them different. Marshall, question: If I yep. type in the same prompts you just did, same format, same everything, will I get something different every time? Yeah, you never. You will not like the the one that we like. This one, you yeah, will never yeah. get this image ever. In fact. I can't get this image again. Like if I do very subtle, which means, hey, I want something similar, it's not going to yeah. give me the same result. It's going to change it slightly. See how it's changing it slightly? Yep. The beard's wow. different. The dragon's different, whatever. There. It looks similar, 
Right? It looks similar, but each of these is completely different. Oh, that was sweet. Oh right? my god. So when yeah. you're when I'm building this stuff, right? I want a better image. One of the things I want to I do all the time is what's around the corner, right? I so I hit very subtle yep. a couple of times or hit very strong a couple of times, right? Because you don't know what's around the corner. Maybe you're gonna get a better image. Maybe the dragon's better or the guy's better, or he's got like, you know, uh tattoos all over his face or, or something and, and that's what you're looking for i don't know right this is the reason why it's so fun is because you you don't know what you're going to get it's always a surprise and sometimes the surprise is great sometimes the surprise is really sucky but you don't know what you're <laughs> going to get that's what makes it fun that's that that's i see how you mentioned earlier that this is i think you said it was like uh you said crack <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Did you say it was addictive like crap? Something along those lines. It is. This, yeah. it's, so this is, I'm I, so impressed. I want oh, you yeah. to look at. So here's my archive, right? These are all the images I did today, right? These are the images I did yesterday. Look at all these. These are the images I did the day before, right? Look at all these, right? Wow. These wow. are the images. This is this is two days ago, right? So you can prompt these, text too. You can ask. Oh yeah, to you make can do text. text. Now here's the thing with text is that text, right? You have to put text in quotation marks. Yeah. Mm. You can't specify fonts or kerning or outline or colors. That's use and it piece. just gives you this weird, wacky thing. It's it's this version that the algorithm we're on now is the yeah. first time it actually gives you like the real word. <laughs> and it 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 doesn't quite do it. If you're a designer like me, you're too big of a OCD font freak to yeah, let yeah. mid journey pick your font out or the, like to me, like, look at this, the space between the T and the R, this drives me bad. Right mm -hmm. you know, I hate that. Right. I hate the mm -hmm. fact that it did trust and then trust. What's up with that? I didn't ask for two trust. <laughs> this, yeah. this thing is just too trusting. I, I, sorry. I had to make that joke. Yeah. But it's like, yeah. you know, um, it's going to get better with the text. Yes. Okay. And here's the sneak preview is this year they're going to be releasing video. So when I type in dragon rap aesthetic oh and say my. video, what type of crazy dragon rap thing is it going to make? Did you see? You just make your own Netflix series at this point. Yes. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, so it, it does, it does all types of wacky stuff. Right. Um, it, I, I did uh, uh, some really cool Eagles. Let me show the Eagle. I, uh, I've got about another, um, about another 10 minutes that I have to go. Okay. So, um, yeah, us too. So, uh, I'm trying to find this, um, check these out. Wow. Right. So imagine that looks so real. Imagine you're doing some sort of vintage DTF transfer, right? Mm -hmm. You want it mm -hmm. to make it 3d. You want it to make it look vintagey and antique antique roadshow style or whatever. Right. Here's the, here's the prompt, right? And, um, hmm. you know, and then, it, of course, you're playing around with this. And, of course, oh. it does. Look at that stupid kerning. Right. And <laughs> this one forgot how to spell it and whatever. But, you know, you can make some really cool stuff. And, of course, you can always change this out and do yep. stuff or whatever. It's so easy to use. Right. That's what makes it great. And I think the, one of the reasons why Mid Journey and all these other programs have caught on is because there's people out there that have this crazy idea in their head and now they can get it out because it's word-based. So this yeah. is why you see like the really lonely guys making the, the beautiful women all the time. But that's the reason why they start <laughs> playing around with superheroes and uh, like these weird grotesque nightmare things is because they, now they have a way to do that because they couldn't ever do that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in is how can I make money with this? How can we make some badass t-shirts or badass DTG or badass digital, or whatever? Here's the, oh, here's another thing. Oh, how do we do embroidery? How should we digitize? Uh, how should we digitize stuff, right? Well, here's how you can digitize a frog, right? Think about how if you created something and now it shows you how to sew it, mm -hmm. right? So I, I did a, um, uh, we're, I did a, uh, some dogs last year, or how about this bear, right? 
how do you sew a bear? It looks like that, right? And just mm -hmm. thinking, thinking things through. Imagine, of course, if this was on a circle, this becomes a, a DTF patch that looks like embroidery, but it's just flat ink, right? You can wow. do a lot of 3D looking things that are just flat ink on a DTF, right? <laughs> Super easily with describing the texture that you want. Um, you know, uh, I you can do am look, mind blown. You can go down. Look the at this for the lead, this. right? That looks. I mean, that looks real, right? What if you What if mm. you were to trim all this extra stuff out and you made a, a DTF of the for the lead? Maybe you're doing something with, you know, I don't know, whatever, right? Um, Put it on the front of her ba baseball cap. Looks like a three D embroidery. Yeah, or, or you want to do some kind of crazy sugar skull thing that's embroidered. Very cool, right? Yeah, so, Marshall, anyway, when's the book creative. dropping? You got a book dropping? Yeah. Mar no, the, the, uh, Marshall Atkinson's Mid Journey 101 Journey? Well, that's the newsletters for. And Mid Journey goes so fast by the time you publish the book, it's outdated. Outdated. Oh, Jeez. Mm. So here's my recommendation. If this interests you, you need to start playing with it. And if you're one of these people that says, uh, that's going to take my job, I can't do that because I went to design school. Okay. I'm going to tell you that there are people right now who went to design school who know how to do this while you're monkeying around for three hours on a design. They've done six designs already and they're making money. That's who's going to be employed is the people who know how to use this tool. Right. I agree. This is no different than learning how to do anything with anything. Right. Yeah. If you know how to drive the tool, you're going to win. Amen. They used to cut trees down with hand saws. Yeah. Yeah. Now they got a tractor that clamps around the tree, chainsaw, chainsaw, chainsaw. It goes into the truck by itself. Okay. Yeah. And three and words. One, yeah. Adapt or die. Yeah. That's what this is going to come down to. Amen. Well, think think about this, right? Not too long ago, the only way to cross the Atlantic Ocean was by ocean liner. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The Wright brothers. Okay. Came and then what changed that was the Boeing Constellation. OK, so when hmm. Boeing came out with that plane, now you could get to Paris in a couple hours. OK, millions of people started flying. Nobody was on the ocean liners anymore. Yep. OK, and that's when the cruise industry was invented. Yeah. So what's going to happen is the because of AI, chat GPT, this type of imaging stuff, whatever, there's all these things that are going to die off because they need to die off. And there's yep. all these things that we don't even know yet. that are going to spring up because of this technology, because people that are creative are going to use it in ways that even the people who are making the software can't imagine. Hmm. But yeah. you won't know what it's like until you start doing it. That's the thing, right? I totally. didn't know how to do this a year ago. Just wasn't even using it. I was doing. Now my, you're an expert. I don't know about an expert. I'm farther down expert. the line, along them somewhere <laughs> else. But, you know. All awesome. Right. So Very anyway, cool. any last other questions or anything? Well, I'm, I'm I can just tell you, you play in design. Yeah, you've piqued my interest. I'm gonna make. Wait, today's Friday, right? Yeah, Monday's a holiday. Yeah. We have family. Tuesday, when I'm in, I'm getting Rob, my web guy, and my designer, to sign up. And get rolling on this. I already told him this is going to drop on Monday, family day. Sean, make sure it sells. He's got no excuse. I already told him you got to yep. watch it and you're subscribing on Tuesday. So, uh, Marshall, <laughs> yeah. I've, yeah. I've had such a great time. I've learned a lot. Um, I, I had tons of other questions for you. I'm glad we didn't get a chance to go through all of them because I think this deep dive into AI was awesome, which means we're going to have yes. to have you back on here again. Yeah, I can always you. come back. You know, <laughs> I can always, now that I got uh, my Google Chrome updated, I think I'll, oh, you know, yeah, that, we're that rolling. was the thing with the show. I had to update Google Chrome and it wouldn't work. And I had to like figure yeah, it out. Yeah. So, well, have you used this anyway, platform before? Just make sure you don't leave. And Sean, you can cut this. Make sure you don't leave yes. till it uploads or else we lose the video footage. Oh, really? Okay. So I, it, I'll just leave it up. Yeah, there don't hang up right away. It's going to take about a minute. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, pretty quick. But yeah, okay. we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and do this. And I'm excited oh, to do this again. It's been fun. 
not just the, the AI, but the background as well to help small businesses make more money, right? Be more profitable. Well, that's, that's my thing. And it, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. You know, my whole deal is helping people. Yeah. You know, uh, way back when, when I was in college, I went to Florida State University. I studied uh, watercolor painting. What an awesome, profitable thing that is. <laughs> Uh, my whole deal was I was going to be an art teacher and coach football, right? That's kind of wow. how I saw my life. And, um, you know, I was teaching, t t teaching, you know, I, and I, I enjoy teaching. I love teaching. Uh, I love helping people. And now that, you know, I'm kind of on the backside of my career, it's like the best thing, right? Because, yep. you know, no more sweating in a warehouse for me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so. I just run my face all day, right? So it's it's good stuff. So I've been inspired. I hope you've inspired some of our listeners. I had a lot of fun. Can't wait to have you on here next time. Again, thank you very much for all your time. We're going to make sure we have some links um, available where customers can sure. reach out and, and uh, hop onto your newsletter. So we're going to get good. that up there for you. Like I said, I think you got two subscribers in this room. So not bad. Yep. Huh? That's 24 great. bucks. Woo! Woo yeah. Here we go. Ready <laughs> <right>. to retire. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll let my wife know so she can go buy some stuff. Right? There, there we go. go. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Marshall. Thanks, All guys. Right. Appreciate Thanks, guys. it. And uh, uh, if you guys out there are stuck in anything, just let me know. Happy to help. So.